Representative Nekochea, Assistant Minority Leader of the House, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, last week when we had Speaker Bedke on the show, he told us that he thought this was a great session overall. What was your impression of this year? Um, I do not share that sentiment. I think we missed the mark in a few key areas. One is on delivering tax policy that can lift up and build a strong working class in Idaho. We cut revenues deeply, um, but not in a way that's gonna help working families. We did not um, enact any real solutions for our property tax woes. And I think we locked us into place um, at 50th in the nation for education investment. We're gonna continue to see a reliance on supplemental levies just so that schools can keep their lights on. And then finally, it was just personally heartbreaking to me to see us leave a $6 million early learning grant hanging there. Um, preschoolers across the state are gonna, or would be preschoolers, I should say, are gonna miss out on an opportunity uh, to get off to a strong start that's gonna help, that would have helped them succeed in school. Sure. So I guess let's get into a few of those issues. Let's start with the property tax bill. The big bill was House Bill 389. Uh, will this make a difference overall for homeowners and for property taxpayers throughout the state, you think? Not really, <laughs> and it's gonna cause some problems. Um, the, there's a marginal increase in the homeowner's exemption, which we all know we need. It's low-hanging fruit to adjust that homeowner's exemption. We're seeing an incredible tax shift onto homeowners and away from other types of property, namely commercial property, since that homeowner's exemption was capped in 2016 and no longer adjusts with housing prices. Um, the problem is, is the increase was so small that it's not even going to cushion most homeowners from, it, from the last year of, of growth in home prices. Right, that was a, a $25,000 increase. Is that right? A 25% from the 100,000 to 125,000? That's correct. Meanwhile, we're seeing in, can in counties like Canyon County and Ada County, home prices over the last year have gone up 42% or 27%. Uh, so that's so small. And really, the homeowner's exemption would be $150,000 today if the legislature hadn't capped it back in 2016. So we're not even making up for mm -hmm. you know, the last four years of growth, let alone this, this latest year. That, um, that is something that we hear from, uh, rep from Republican lawmakers sometimes. They say, they point back to the numbers and say, well, when the homeowner's exemption was indexed, it actually went down from 100,000. But you're saying that the times since then, it, it would be much higher than that, that that argument doesn't hold as much water? That's right, because they, the environment has changed, and I think the interests who <laughs> pursued that cap on the homeowner's exemption could see the future and could see what was going to happen, and that if that um, you know some people are making out very well in this system where home prices grow rapidly, our property taxes are a function of those you know taxable the, the taxable value of your home, and so homeowners are just carrying more and more of that load. While we see commercial properties in the same neighborhood see their property taxes go down year after year, and it's not sustainable and it's not fair, and we just have to get back to a fair, predictable balance. Sure, and the homeowner the homeowners exemption was not the only program that was addressed in that bill. There was also the circuit breaker uh, property tax program, and could you maybe explain a little bit what that circuit breaker program is for the folks who don't know? Sure. So that's a property tax assistance program for seniors and people with disabilities and you apply based on your income and you can get a certain level of, uh, of assistance to help you know, buy down your property tax bill a little bit. And what this bill did was it made a very small, small increase into the level of assistance you could get. We haven't updated that since 2006. It made a small change in um, the level of income that, that made you eligible. Mm -hmm. The problem is that to pay for these small increases, which are gonna be about $2 million a year, they're actually cutting seniors out of the program. So they're not adding any more property tax assistance to the, you know, <laughs> to the state. They're cutting seniors out who happen to have a, a home level uh, or a home value that's a little bit above the median in their county. And there are plenty of seniors with modest homes who are seeing you know, growth and <laughs> just springing up around them, mm -hmm. and they're gonna be caught um, in, this, in, this, in this really bad, <laughs> bad bill that, that does harm. We should strive to do no harm, and we're doing harm in this bill. It is an interesting 
tweak that they make? Because like you say, the program used to be based entirely on, on income level. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, they adjusted the, in, the bill adjusts the, those income levels, but also adds uh, a cutoff based on the value of the home. Is that right? That's correct. And there was a lot of talk about of multi-million dollar homes getting this program. That's not what they put in the bill. <laughs> they put in the bill if you're at you know, 25% above the median home value for your county, even if you're extremely low income, you are cut from the program. Mm -hmm. And a, there is a delayed implementation in that, though, right? There's a, there's a, a year before that goes into effect? Um, that will hit come January. Come January. So it will hit before we have a time, we have the chance to change it. To change it, okay. Well, thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, so would you be happy with these circuit breaker changes if there wasn't that, that cutoff added to the, to the program? Um, I could have supported <laughs> it, even though, even though those changes are modest, I would like to see, I would have liked to have seen a more generous, um, um, increase to that assistance that, you know, for seniors, just like this bill does for businesses. This bill increases a, a business property tax exemption to the tune of $8 million, and the bill is going to take $8 million of state money to fund that. Meanwhile, the property tax assistance for seniors, that modest increase, is funded by kicking some seniors out of the program, and that's an unfortunate, those are unfortunate priorities, and I don't think those are the priorities of Idahoans. Sure, the prioritization there. Um, and then there's also in the bill, there's a budget cap provision for local governments. We just keep running down the cafeteria list, it feels like. Um, some cities like Caldwell have discussed a moratorium on new development due to some of this legislation. We've heard concerns from NAMPA. Um, do you see any solutions to the city's concerns that could come about next year? Um, I think we just need to undo that piece of the bill. It's gonna be very harmful to public safety and emergency response. It's a, you know, we already have in statute these growth caps on budgets and then these with, with factors that account for growth so that if, you <laughs> if your city grows, you can hire additional uh, emergency responders, law enforcement officers, and do all of those things you, do, you need to do to keep services at a level that, that, that protects residents. Um, this part of the bill just serves no pur pur purpose other than to really wreak havoc on local budgets. And we heard in one of the committee hearings that from a Nampa fire official that they're already three fire stations short of what they need to have response times that are at you know best practices, you know what, what a national standard would be. And this bill just exacerbates how far, far behind we are on services. And I think this part of the bill is actually serves just to be a distraction from the tax shift <laughs> that's being inadequately addressed. Sure, you think it's an, it's an issue of where the taxes are assessed, not the, uh, the amount of taxes, but how they're distributed? Would you say is, is the bigger pro problem when we talk about property taxes? Yeah, I think we have to leave these decisions about level of services to local governments. People elect their city council, they elect their mayors, they elect county commissioners, they elect those people to make those decisions and, and set services at the level that residents want. If residents are saying, well, we'd rather have slower <laughs> ambulance response time, then you know those local officials can make those decisions, but for the state to use its heavy hand to force service cuts, to mandate service cuts in these fast-growing areas is unconscionable. And you know the question I'm asking is, you know, with whom does the buck stop now when someone has a stroke or a heart attack and they don't get to the hospital in time? You know, I think the legislature is going to bear some responsibility. Property taxes have been a, a the headline issue for uh, the two years that I've been here covering the legislature anyway, and I uh, can assume longer than that. Um, but it seems like bills addressing property tax issues hardly get introduced unless you have the full weight of leadership behind you uh, to get it through that tax committee. And uh, there have been some criticisms of the process for uh, House Bill 389 uh, that it came so fast at the very end of the session. Um, and there may have been stakeholders involved, but largely those conversations were out of the public view behind closed doors. Um, as a representative who sits on that tax committee, what is your uh, position looking into those conversations and, and how do you see that process going behind um, the closed doors? Th that's exactly right. I submitted <laughs> bills myself to re-index the property, the homeowner's exemption. Um, we have to have an exemption that adjusts with home prices automatically. We can't have this fight every year where special interests who are <laughs> benefiting um, from the tax shift onto homeowners um, kind of get to um, get to interfere with with that exemption. So I was disappointed that disappointed that my bill didn't get a hearing. I was a co-sponsor on, on another bill um, that would have um, gotten us back to 
um, indexing. I, you know, I think we can look at having an indexed um, homeowner's exemption that varies by county. The Ada County um, residents need a different homeowner's exemption than those in, in Gem County because we have different, um, you know, different realities. None of that could be discussed. We, this was the only option and, and it was a really unfortunate because I think a lot of people voted for it <laughs> knowing that it had a lot of problems but they kind of just shrugged and said, well, this is, this is gonna be the only option I have. And it's a really unhealthy way to make policy where just a few people in leadership get to decide what's heard and what's not. And it's always been, it's in the case in property taxes and it's in the same, we saw the same thing with the big income uh, tax bill. Yeah, let's change gears a little bit and move on to that income tax bill. I don't want to talk people's ears off with property taxes for the whole show. Um, so as far as income taxes go, that was House Bill 380. Can you walk us through the top line view of what that bill did? Yeah, so it has two, two main things. It um, has a one-time rebate and then it has ongoing permanent income tax rate cuts. And both the rebate and the um, the permanent income tax rates are, t adjustments are very lopsided. So working families, people with modest incomes are going to see very little change in their tax bill. And it was actually, I've never seen a rebate done this way because the rebate was done with mostly with funds from sales tax revenue from our online sales tax fund. Um, but instead it was given back according to how people paid their income taxes in 2019. So you're gonna see people you know, in the top 1% get four or $5,000 back. And you know, the, the people with low, facing low wages are gonna get $50 back. Right, and that, that just, rebate, it's a floor of $50 up to, was it 9% of your 20, that, that percentage might be wrong, but a, a percentage of your 2019 return. That's correct. So, it's, so when you look at what's been happening in the last year and a half and who struggled from you know, cut hours, a layoff that they had to weather you know, in 2020, um, you know, reduced business, um, small business revenue. Those people who are actually hurting are getting very little. And then the people who've, you know, who are doing very well, the people who need it the least are getting a huge windfall. And, um, and, and then we also see this, you know, the same thing happening in, in what they did on the, the permanent income tax, ta income tax cuts, giving away a, a lot of, re cutting a lo we're cutting a lot of revenue out of the revenue stream. Again, kind of locking ourselves in at 50th in the nation. Um, for a education investment, but again, it's not flowing out in ways that are gonna build a strong working class, strong and a strong middle class for Idaho. And those corporate rate reductions also concern me because when you cut corporate income taxes, those people, you know, shareholders live all over the world, so it can be up to 80% of those dollars that flow all the way out of the state. Sure, the benefit's not just going to Idaho residents. Right, whereas you, when you give a tax rebate back to working class folks, they are gonna spend it in their local economy and it has that ripple effect. When they sign their kids up for dance lessons, you know, buy new, a new pair of shoes, get their hair cut, get their oil changed, those things really build a strong local economy. Part of the conversation around this income tax bill on the House floor was the opportunity cost. If mm. we're going to be cutting revenues, um, how is this going to impact education and other priorities in the budget? So what are, what are your concerns in that field? Yeah, I mean, there were so many better things <laughs> we could have done with the, you know, $380 million or, or so um, that went to that income tax reduction. First, what our caucus proposed was a balanced approach. Between, let's, let's take half of that and let's fund education that's gonna relieve some of that pressure at, you know, on property taxes by reducing the needs for supplemental levies. And then let's take the other half and l really invest in working Idahoans who have been left behind over and over again these past couple of decades. When you look at tax policies, they've always been concentrated on cutting those top rates. So we proposed increasing the child tax credit and, and, and allowing Idahoans of all income levels to access the full value of that child tax credit. Right now, um, only you know, our highest earners can get the, get the full value of it. But then also, let's create a sliding value tax credit for working families that can help lift people, um, working folks, uh, into, into a middle class. Um, for the same reasons I, I just said about um, creating that multiplier effect or the, the ripple effect in our local economies by putting more dollars back into the hands of people who really need them. But there are so many other, we could have just taken that money and also I, I would have supported just 
um, letting it flow to local taxing districts so that they could have reduced property taxes accordingly. And I talked to many friends across the aisle when I said, why are we doing, spending all this money here when we, could be, we should be addressing property taxes? And I heard so many times, oh yeah, that's what I'm hearing from my voters about. <laughs> oh yeah, my constituents are more worried about property taxes. No one's complaining to us about income tax rates. And so what it's really about is making sure we're being responsive to what Idaho voters want and not just what some select special interests lobbying at the Capitol are asking for. Sure. So if we run the counterfactual, if we lived in a parallel universe where Democrats were the supermajority in the Idaho legislature, I, I know it's a far stretch at the moment, but if you guys were to pass a income tax bill and structure the system how you wanted, what, what sort of uh, changes would you make to the current system or to the system as it stands now with this new bill? Yeah, well, we, we did that with the Idaho Working Families agenda that we um, announced and we submitted bills to do <laughs> to do those things and we did not get not get hearings on them um, so in addition to the things I mentioned uh, increasing the child tax credit and making it fully accessible mm -hmm. so that for for families and then in creating a work uh, working tax credit that sliding scale to help build one of robust and ever-growing middle class we also really wanted to finally fully fund kindergarten across the state and put some dollars towards that. Right now we have an uneven patchwork. It's a, it's a system of haves and have nots. If you are lucky, maybe your school district is able to offer full day kindergarten or maybe you, your school district offers it and it's a, but it's a fee for service and you have to pay for it and you're lucky enough to be able to pay for it. Um, but a lot of our kindergartners are only getting two and a half hours a day of instruction and if they didn't have a preschool opportunity, which is true for two thirds of um, young Idaho kids, mm -hmm. they're already showing up at kindergarten behind. Half of our kindergartners show up in the fall already behind on their just basic basic skills that help them learn to read, like knowing their, knowing their letters. Yeah, literacy has been a big goal for the state for a long time here. Exactly, and full day kindergarten is proven to help build those early literacy, literacy skills and help make sure kids are reading on time so that they learn to read so then they can read to learn mm -hmm. um, as they go through their school career. And so we really wanted to see that, that money get into fully funding full day kindergarten so that it's not left up to chance and every kid gets a full day of instruction in kindergarten. Right, and that full day kindergarten bill was on the table at least for a short time this session. We will see if it comes back next session. Um, I wanted to ask you one final question before we wrap things up here. Uh, leaving 2020, 2021 behind, uh, yesterday, Speaker Bedke announced that he's running for lieutenant governor, which means uh, it is going to be time for a shakeup in House leadership. Um, looking forward to eventually in come 2023, mm -hmm. what characteristics are you looking for in a new House Speaker when the time comes? Um, I, once, I would love to see um, leadership that allows more ideas to be circulated. Uh, it's, it's hard when you have, we, we believe, we know we have good ideas that Idahoans support funding, fully funding kindergarten, um, investing in our preschool ch children, um, having tax policy that's fair, increasing the homeowner's exemption and indexing it, but we can't get hearings on any of those things. So I would love more openness uh, for the exchange of ideas. And we also need leadership that's, that is also just ready to govern. Um, in the House, we have problems just passing basic budget bills. There are so many bills that pass, and we, we made a list of them that you know, they pass because of Democrats, because there are few, and there are so few of us. Um, but we make the difference on just a passing a lot of basic bills to help keep our state running. And so we, we need leadership that's not there to, you know, kind of blow things up and uh, listen to radical ideas or get tied up in conspiracy theories, but really to govern, invest in our public institutions, invest in education, invest in our um, universities and colleges, and and help help Idaho, you know, invest in the things that Idaho needs today so that we can prosper in the future and have a strong economy in the future. We can't neglect those critical investments because it will hurt us in the long run. For sure. It may be su super minority, but when votes come down to a margin of two or three, it, it is enough to make the difference. Uh, Assistant Minority Leader, Laura Nikachea, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Thanks, Logan. It was a pleasure.